Here we go. Come on in. Come on in. Hey guys. Um, lots and lots of weird, just technical difficulties tonight. Um, bear with me. We're just going live on TikTok. No TikTok live studio. No fancy production. We're just going to have a fun little interview. Come on in, guys. Come on in. I see Polar right there. How are you doing? I'm going to invite Polar on in. And let's... Um... Do, 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 do. Why is it not? There he is. Inviting Polar in. Here he comes. Um, I don't know if my internet or what it is, but Basana, how are you tonight? Michelle, good to see you. Hey, guys. Come on in. Just say hey. Uh, let us know what's going on. Um, let, are you working on anything? Let me get this guy up a little bit further. Um, Can you see me now and we, hear me? Now, got you way down in the corner there, guys. We're going to get this started real quick. Um, my microphone into a phone stand now. <laughs> there we go. All right. Yeah, no, I printed out my notes really quick. Uh, 66 Mustang, how are you doing? Innovadia, how are you? Come on in the room, guys. Say hey. Let us know what you're up to. I'm gonna get, I've got to reconfigure my lights just because we uh, have all sorts of fun, lots of little technical issues, but the show must go on, right? The show must go on. So we're gonna have fun. We're gonna have a great interview. TT Fitz, how are you? Come on in the room, say hey. Guys, let me know you're here. Say hi, wave, do something. Tell me about a project you're working on. We're always looking for something really, really interesting. Um, we usually wait, just kind of let the show roll for a little bit uh, for the first 10 minutes, just to kind of get more people in the room. Hit those likes. Get those likes going. Uh, let's get up there. Let's get a lot of people in this room. Joseph, how are you doing? Good to see you. Got a Jose coming on in the room. And Dot, good to see you all tonight. Uh, just hop on in here. We're going to have a really, really, really good time. Just tap and share, invite all sorts of people in here. I don't care if they are a 3D printer or are not a 3D printer. This is going to be an interview for everybody. There's going to be a lot to learn. Um, I'm excited about this one. I don't have any videos to play. We can't do any fun jokes or stuff. I do have a test, though. I'm going to make uh, Mitch here uh, follow. So y'all come on in. Let me say, hey, hey, is there a project you're working on right now? Something you're really excited about that you're doing that uh, you want to share with us? Just let us know. Darius, how's it going? Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. I'm doing a little bit different format tonight. And so this one's going to be a little bit of fun. Um, we all come on in. I'm doing this for Grant. Well, I'm glad you're doing it for Grant. Come on in and say, hey, Dave. Eddington, how are you doing? Now, come on in. While Mitch gets his stuff uh, ready and set up, we're just going to keep chatting. Going to talk about that everything. That, like, uh, has been... Plug in a USB cable hey. 300 times in opposite directions, and none of them are right. I know. I'm, I'm trying to get my charger over here so my phone doesn't die. Damn, hey, how's it going, mine Nate? Mine Good to see you. Like that's dangerous. <laughs> I'm sweep my phone back just a little bit. Swing us a bit around. There we go. Hey guys, come on in. Lee, Tooling Lee, good to see you. you know, that, that, I always get confused with Tooling Lee. <laughs> so many names come up for Tooling Lee, and I don't know why. Uh, good to see you guys. Come on in, Steven. Got you here. Hey guys, what, while we are just kind of chatting and everything right here up at the front, uh, keep tapping. Let's get those uh, numbers up really quick for us. Let's get a lot of people in here. We've got Mitch here tonight. And if you don't know anything about Polar Filaments and Mitch, this is a really, really good thing, uh, good show for you to watch. Um, not only is Mitch a great guy, but he makes some amazing filament. And after tonight's interview, I believe you're going to know exactly why his filament is so amazing. Uh, really, really good stuff. Fun conversations. We don't have the pictures and videos that I normally show, but we can get here. We can get through this without it. How's it going, Ray Sussman? Good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> I hope that uh, I hope that your experience with um, multiboard is going well, and that I'm wondering, Ray, had you moved from uh, Raspberry Pis over to Android yet? You keep talking about that. I got your first birth printer as a birthday gift a few weeks ago. Nice. I got some polar filament to test with. It's a good filament. It's a good filament. I, you know, it's a good one to test with. And um, like I said, you'll find out tonight why it's such a good filament because there's some really, he does a really good job. Uh, if there's anybody that I know that is a uh, filament creator, 
that is Mitch, and he is innovative and plays with it and has fun. And he's one of those, you know, you always hear when it, when it, uh, uh, who, who was it? Uh, Alexander Graham Bell said, I didn't fail. I just learned 100 other ways not to do something. And I think that's probably how Mitch thinks about it. too. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of failures, but they're good. You, you embrace those. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so come on in, guys. Thank you. Mario Tiago, how are you? Nano Boo 84 Good to see you. Um, this is an Android house, but Raspberry Pi is fun to play with. Raspberry Pis are fun to play with. They really, really are. Getting things down here. There we go. I feel a little overexposed. Um, all right. Yeah, thank you for the invite, Tooling Lee. Thank you so much for uh, inviting people, guys. Y'all keep tapping and hitting those likes. Uh, we're going to get into this interview in just a little bit. Um, some of the things to think about, the word for the week is, we didn't have a word for the week, sorry, I failed on that aspect, um, but I think that we're going to have uh, an interesting uh, idea, continuation of what we did last year about doing what you love, and sometimes uh, you may not know what you love at first, and you work your way around to finding out what you do love, and uh, that's a really, really good, Mario, good to see you. You haven't missed anything. We are just now getting started, Mario. So stick around, yeah. hit those like buttons, get more people in here. Polar filament. There you go. I'm told this here is my little name tag for the rest of the, the thing. It looks <laughs> like OBS. Who needs OBS when you have an iPad? I know, guys. I, exactly. Exactly. Who needs it? Who needs it? Right. Um, hey, Mitch, what have you yep. got to drink tonight? I always ask that. You got any food or drink? What's well, what's your, your poison? Setup, I upgraded to uh, just bourbon on the rocks because uh, setup was a little bit of a hassle today. <laughs> it was a little bit of a hassle today, wasn't it? Well, I am going with the Coke Zero today. So uh, I am um, taking it a little slow for myself. Bill, how are you doing? Come on in, guys. Say hey. Luna, how are you? Good to see you, Manuel. Um, thank you for those likes. Keep those likes going. Let's just get a lot of people in here. Remember, the reason we do these interviews is not just to see these people, but is to learn a little bit more about them and to expose them to a different group of people. So let's get all our friends in here. Let's let everybody know about Mitch and Polar Filaments and the things that he's doing and why he is so good at what he does. So the bourbon, you have any food or anything? I, I don't have Not any food. I already ate dinner. I Not do tonight. B-dubs every Thursday night. It's been like a ritual for the past, like, I don't know, probably seven or eight years where I do not miss a Thursday for the BOGO wing night. So slam some wings, had all of those, but... Now I'm washing it down with some bourbon. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, Nate's Print Shop, how are you doing tonight? Crafty Labs 3D, good to see you in here as well. Mark, good to see everybody. Keep coming in. We're almost there. We're going to get started here in just about a minute. But Wing Night, that's a good choice. That's awesome. Yeah, they're, they're mild sauce, not matched by anyone else. I always get into the argument with people <laughs> about wings versus sauce. I don't go there for the wings. I go for the sauce. But. Okay, I, I'm not going <laughs> to argue with you on that. I'm, uh, I'm picky on my sauce, too. Um, ever since I've had the original buffalo, I'm like, now I know what it tastes like. Now it's just, you get, it's a different level. You just don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, I think I got like freaked out a long time ago, not too long ago, but uh, it was when uh, I think like Arby's Corporation or something was like buying B-dubs and then there was like rumors of it disappearing forever. And I was like, no, no, I will single-handedly keep them in business by going every Thursday. So I got this. it's been a quest. Good. It's good. I used to hang out. That was kind of my, I'm a cigar guy. And so Buffalo Wild Wings on uh, late like Thursday night with a cigar out on the deck with some wings was just a really, really good night. And I'm a mild guy. I also like the garlic. The garlic are pretty good too. Yep. But the mild, the mild is pretty good. Um, all right, guys. Well, welcome. Uh, we got Evan saying it's a must every Thursday night. Well, I think we're, we're right there with you, but, um, guys, I want to go, he's been here the whole time, but I just want to go on and welcome Mitch and, uh, thank him for jumping into this crazy thing that only lives in my mind. And uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna look at Mitch through my eyes, and I hope y'all have the journey uh, that I have. Um, 
I've had the uh, the fortune of spending a lot of time with Mitch and just kind of hanging out with him at some of the Rep Rap festivals. We've gotten to know each other and uh, have really, really had a good time. If you have questions, guys, put your questions down. I'm going to add the questions in as we go. I have a bunch of questions myself, but we're going to start kind of stepping through here. And I always remember, I always try to find a story in this thing. So we're going to start off with your story, uh, Mitch. Can you tell us a little bit like... You don't have to go into great details, but kind of if you want where you were born, kind of are, are you still in the same area? Oh, and how did you then, move? Huh? <laughs> I thought huh? it was going to be the story from Filament, where, where I was born. All right. No, we're we're <laughs> going to do some of that. We're going to do some of that. But so I always like to talk about people's stories because everybody has a journey. They have something that takes them to the point that they are now. And so in the beginnings, I like to just kind of see, you know, what brought you to filament. So in, can you look back in your childhood and see that path that brought you to where you are now? Yeah. Um, I mean, some background, I'm from the Michigan area. I was born and raised just outside in, uh, of Detroit and Metro Detroit area. Um, went to uh, high school and stuff here locally, and then went to Michigan tech for college. Um, pretty much I've always done computer stuff. I've always done a lot of software my entire life since, uh, I don't know, since I was in like grade school and stuff. Um, after that went over to, uh, Wisconsin for a little over a year to do some software development at a medical company called Epic. Um, that was like the kind of like go-to software engineering type job. So my background, background is all software engineering. Um, but then, uh, there was a family friend that, uh, has a machine shop, um, back here in Michigan. And I came back here for a summer once and just kind of worked for like intern pay, um, just to kind of be near family for the summer. And that was where I was exposed to robotics for the first time. And the part that I liked about robotics is that it's still programming. So like all the programming knowledge could be like applied to something that was physical. And I kind of fell in love with that because it, it just felt a little bit more real than creating like an app because something just didn't feel right about being able to open up a laptop, type, be done, and you don't really have anything physical to show. Whereas like a robot, you can physically take it with you, you can show it off. Um, so I kind of like fell in love with that, which got me into more of like the hardware side of things. Um, and at that point, worked at uh, Kuka Robotics, which had bought the previous company. So I was uh, doing autonomous vehicles at Kuka Robotics for a bit. Um, and then that was where 3D printing kind of started to grow a little bit more. And a lot more of the autonomous vehicles were having more and more 3D printed parts. Um, and it got so much so that it used to just be like, a 3d printer that i would work on and then it just became so much of my time that it kind of prompted me i'm like i either have to do this full time or i have to give it up completely um which direction do i want to go and that was where 3d printing kind of like kicked off so um polar filament is a new brand but the company that's kind of like the parent company um is douglas innovation which is something that myself and uh two other guys started um that has been around since 2016 or 2017 and then uh, the filament part was really born out of kind of the pandemic because um, we just had a lot of our customers were very like they, they didn't care what was going on. I mean, if they had a delivery, they needed a delivery and they didn't care uh, what was wrong or what was wrong with the supply chain. So we basically had to figure out a way to get filament faster because we couldn't buy it and it was all backlogged. So that was where we got a line. Um, we started making it for ourselves or just using it for ourselves to kind of fulfill everything. Um, it was a huge hassle to get it for just like just us like it was extremely overkill and we realized that pretty early on when we were just uh making filament for like a couple of hours each week like we'd run it one day a week for like two hours and we'd be all set we'd have plenty of filament um but then we kind of got to the point where after everything calmed down we kind of figured everything out we we're just like what if we make more what happens we have like everything's already kind of taken care of we had our business case so uh we started making it to sell under the brand name polar filament because no one wanted to get filament from a company called douglas innovation so uh that was kind of where that was born um it's been a lot of fun now to kind of enter the hobbyist world because most of my background is the industrial world and nothing really makes sense in the industrial world like everyone asks us to print weird parts or design weird parts but i don't know what they are they're just weird shapes and they're not as nice is having like i don't know like the other day someone printed like a huge skull and right now we're printing like a six foot tall flexi rex for our lobby lobby and like that's just way cooler than any type of like i don't care how good your bracket is for a robot i mean it never looks cool so right that's about it uh, no i got you that makes that makes sense hey guys keep tapping thank you, you guys up to 2.6 
Okay, likes. That is awesome. That is amazing. Thank you for the gifts. Uh, keep tapping. Let's get more people in here. So, all right. So I feel like part of it was skipped. And here's what I, I want to. So you were doing the automotive and you were printing. But with that, what you're saying is you had parts you needed to fulfill. And when you couldn't get the filament you needed to fulfill those parts, you started your own print line. Yep. Is that what I'm understanding? Okay. Yep. So it's all okay. Just scale. It's mostly timing. Timing was the biggest thing. Cause like we got everyone so used to like, I don't know, a couple day turnaround for things because at the time we were doing a lot of just Amazon or local, anything you could book like pre pandemic, you could get filament in two days or something from no matter what. And then after the pandemic, then it was like, you couldn't even guarantee that you get it in a month or two. Um, yeah, so that was really good inspiration. A week or whatever. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. So now when you were printing the initial parts, I mean, I, so what was that first filament you had to start providing that you started making? Was it a PLA or was there a certain type of material black you were PLA. using? <laughs> uh, it was, we, we pretty much did, everything is either black uh, or like yellow. That was pretty much it. Those were like the two colors. So it's yellow if it needed to be high visibility and it was black for anything else. Um, black was always consistent across different brands at the time when we were buying it from other places. So it was pretty safe. Um, and it actually got to the point where that I was so ingrained in that, like no one ever cared about color. It was either high visibility or it didn't matter. Those were the two classes. And, uh, when I went to the Midwest Rep Rep Festival, Murph for the first time, uh, that was where somebody like came up to our table and I was proud. We had like five colors maybe at that point. I was like, look at our five colors that we have. And then somebody came up and they're like, oh, what color blues do you have? And I was like, hold on, did you say blue with an S at the end? I'm like, we have blue right here. This, the, the only blue that you'll ever need. So that was kind of like the intro. And I like saw everybody else's booths and they have like 400 different blues. And I'm like, all right, well, it's time to yeah. step up the game here. Um, what but year that was, was your first year? What was that? What year was that? What year that was, was that? 2021 was the first time I went to Murph. Okay. Or no, 20, yeah, 2021. Okay. Okay. So, and keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, I mean, colors were all new to me. Um, I have a very like strong engineering background and very rarely do engineers care about two different shades of blue. Uh, but now I've kind of gone down that rabbit hole. Like I'm no expert, but like I've done a lot of trial and error when it comes to like color theory. And I don't know I, I used to only think that seven colors existed in all of earth. And now I see like all the different shades and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but now I now two colors don't match and it bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I have to agree with Kaylin. Kaylin says that's that is such an unhinged way to get to making filament. Um, I love it. I think that's awesome. Um, you know, and that's what's really cool about the stories and everything. We got Zoidberger saying that's how he ended up with a Froyo shop. So well. I'm going to have to interview him and ask that question down the road. Let me write that down. Froyo shop. Um, no, that, that is awesome. So, um, so and I'm, I'm going to kind of step back and we'll work way a little bit uh, further. Um, what got you to be the one who started making the filament? Like you've got the three guys who started the company and you need to get filament in and Hey, we're going to let Mitch do this. What, what, what was that process? Why? Well, I was always the, the printing guy just because, uh, the, there's the other two guys, one of them's more of like the businessy guy. So like, he was kind of like, Hey, here, I'm going to make sure that the business part works out. You go play with your machines and go have fun. And I'll tell you if we're making money or not. So that's kind of his role. Um, and then the other guy's role was always more electrical. Um, and he did, we had like, we made a lot of wire harnesses. Um, we also do like circuit boards and stuff like that. So he was more in like the, the wire harness territory. And I was more in like the, more involved in the 3D printing stuff. That being said, uh, the other guy that I was talking about, the electrical guy, his name is Alex. He's extremely involved in filament now. So like he, he spends a lot of time working on it. So he's kind of like migrated over to that as well. He has a strong engineering okay. background as well. Um, but yeah, I was just, I did the 3d printing stuff. So it was just natural that I did the filament, even though they're not related at all. Like, I mean, they're, they're two completely <laughs> yeah, different right. things. Um, but everything is kind of self-learned and having ba basically like a machining and robotics background helps like design and create the machine from the ground up. And we're constantly ripping that thing apart and doing different things and on weekends going to make new parts on a lathe or whatnot. So it's, it's a lot of custom stuff. Okay. And that's what I was yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, well, how do you see the robots, robot, robotics and your programming fitting into what you do now? 
Well, the way I describe it is extrusion is nothing new. So like something that's really, really similar to filament is like weed whacker lines, fishing lines and stuff. Uh, they just have different requirements. So uh, for example, like fishing line, it's really important that it doesn't get too thin because you don't want it to snap. It's got to have a certain rating for like how many pounds it can hold. Um, so that means that if they have like tolerance fluctuations, they don't really care. They just care about the minimum. So if it's fluctuating all over the place, as long as it doesn't dip below a certain area, that's totally fine. Um, and filament does matter a lot about that. So a lot of these extrusion lines are built to like spit out plastic, but not necessarily to hold like a good tolerance or a good shape. So like basically not only tolerance the diameter, but we care about whether or not it's an oval or squished one way or another. Um, and that's kind of something that's more unique to 3D printing. Matters a lot in this industry where it doesn't otherwise. Um, so that's kind of the stuff that like, whenever we're doing an upgrade is just kind of like, I don't know, trying to trying to come up with a way to solve that problem. It's not necessarily something that you can just go out and buy. Um, so a lot of it is custom. A lot of it is trial and error. So I've got like buckets of all of the like failed parts or old parts that we've done. Um, just constantly making new parts. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey guys, thank you for the likes. Thank you for the gifts. We got a bunch of lightning bolts and stuff going on here. Kalen, <sighs> looks like someone is challenging us to a duet. So if you decide to come up with some likes on that, uh, we'll have to get together and do a duet. Right, Kalen? <laughs> so sometimes I set up a bunch of likes, and if they hit that goal, I'll sing. Um, I'm not prepared at all to sing tonight. <laughs> but um, Okay, so um, let's see. So we've got that. And one of the things I'll have to say, because and I like part of the story is I do with my work with filament stories, I meet so many filament companies where the people I'm talking to don't print. They don't know what uh, they wouldn't even know what to do with a normal printer when they hit it. So I really like the fact that you approached it from the printing side and you've kind of got this mentality of all of us out here who are playing with the printers and doing things. And I think that's also part of, I think the programming and the robotics is part of your passion for testing and all the different things that you do. And I think, I think that's really, really interesting. Uh, what was your first printer? What printer were you printing on first? Let's say this, what printer were you printing on at work? And then what was your first printer at home? Uh, first printer I ever was exposed to is an XYZ Da Vinci. Um, bought that when I was at, uh, in college for, uh, uh, it was part of a group called ACM, which was the Association for Computing Machinery. So it was just kind of like we had a budget to get just cool things, high tech things. So I got like a printer um, for anyone that doesn't know the XYZ Da Vinci's were the ones that had locked down filament. So it's kind of like all coming full circle. Now you could only get their branded filament. They were uh, I don't remember if they were chipped or what, um, but I remember just kind of being exposed for the first time, not really understanding it. Um, it only took a matter of time for it to jam for the first ever time. And I was like, oh, this thing's garbage. It, it doesn't work at all. And that was where I learned that printers are just like, 3D printers are just like 2D printers when it comes to how finicky they are, except they've got an extra dimension to worry about. Um, but then, uh, so that was that. And then when I was at work, uh, I was actually working with Stratasys printers, um, also with a cartridge system that I hated. So I spent a lot of my time uh, kind of reverse engineering the chips. Um, eventually got those unlocked um, so that way I could use whatever filament I wanted. And then when I realized how much like time and money I was sinking into it, that was right when Creality was kind of making their debut. And I was like, hey, for like less than the cost it costs that it is for like a spool of filament, I can buy an entire 3D printer. Uh, at the time, I think there were like six or seven hundred bucks for a Creality CR10. I uh, got one of those and then that was where it was off to the races because like even with a Stratasys printer uh, when we would print and sell a part if it was like a weird bracket it would cost almost as much as a machine part it would be like three or four hundred dollars for us to actually make it just because of the plastic itself uh, a, a spool of filament was like 250 bucks for a kilogram um, so it was really 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 expensive um, so then when I was able to get like really cheap stuff um, then I was able to sell parts for like 20 bucks that would normally cost like 200 bucks or something. So it was like a 10th of the price. And that was where everything exploded. Some of the designer guys there uh, really got excited about 3D printing. Um, they were just kind of like going through the whole robot. And they're like, oh, this could be printed. This could be printed. This could be printed. And that was where like it slowly turned from all laser cut and machine parts to more and more 3D printed parts. And to this day, they're still using tons of 3D printed parts on it. Um, That's awesome. And then. That's uh, awesome. 
Yeah, I don't know. There's all sorts of printers throughout the history, but that was kind of the start. <laughs> Stratus is, is like my dream, like the J35 Stratus, you know, I, that's like, ah, that's the one I want. One day, well, I'll be able to afford a $100,000 printer. Um, one day. <laughs> Yeah. And then I'll have to give it back because I won't be able to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we've gone through all of that. Now you're making filament and we'll just kind of start getting into uh, some of the other stuff. And now currently how many, how many lines of filament do you make? Like how many uh, different filament different types? within your polar filament? Yeah um that's a tough question so there's there's the stuff that we sell on our website we have like pla um pet g and then like i think we maybe have black abs on there but there are a lot of weird ones that we make for businesses um so there is like for example one that's really popular is fire retardant abs um there's things like tpu tpe sebs um pva um, there's some weird custom materials. I don't even know what they actually are. People come up and they're like the actual plastic pellet manufacturers say, hey, we invented this new pellet. We're trying to see if it can be used for all these different manufacturing techniques. So they go up to like injection molding companies and say, will it injection mold? They go up to us and they're like, can it 3D print? Come up to uh, other people and say like, will it extrude into building blocks? So um, there's a lot of R&D that goes into it. Um, most things fail, probably 90% of things don't work out. So we try a lot of things, get your hopes up and then they just don't work. But um, yeah, I think it's just the, yeah. those few though, Pet G, PLA and uh, ABS on our site. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. That is, that is really cool. Now that's neat. I like that idea of the prototyping. And I think that probably uh, just in our conversations, like the prototyping and the stuff that happens behind the scenes is what to me keeps you going like that seems to be the stuff that you really 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 enjoy and and you love uh let's see we got let me see if there's any other questions here what's the most interesting 3d print prototype slash part you've ever come across hey akuma how's it going good to see you hmm. most interesting part you might not even be able to talk about it <laughs> I don't know. I don't see as many 3D printed parts as much as I used to because I used to do the actual 3D printing of parts. And now that I make the filament, I like send it out and then other people are 3D printing parts. Um, I know there was an art display that was going on uh, for the new Amazon headquarters that was printing six foot tall um, mushrooms um, out of Pet G that was made from recycled bottles. So um, that was cool. I think I never saw it, <laughs> but like that, those are like the things that I'm I'm hearing about. Um, uh, there's some other things that like other projects, there's like a, a trucking company was trying to replace some, uh, metal, um, like, I don't know what to call them, like grates that you walk on, um, with 3d printed plastic parts, entirely plastic, no metal. So, uh, that was another really cool project. Um, and then most of the time it's really just like the, the ones that get me the most excited are like the cost saving ones where somebody's like, Hey, we've got this really expensive custom bracket for some really expensive, like laser scanner or something like that. And then you can 3d print it for like 10 or 15 bucks. And they're like, Hey, this thing used to cost us $800 a piece. So like, those are like the best news that I can give to somebody. Cause it's, it's really custom. So those are the stuff I like. How about the, how about the favorite thing? Is there, I know you've got your discord. Yeah. You know, we both have our discords guys. Uh, you should see him. If you jump in my bio or his bio, you'll, you'll see, uh, stuff that'll lead you to the discord. What is, do you have like people who create things or who are really innovative in your discord that are kind of showing off different parts they're creating with your filament? Oh, people have printed a bunch of things and been posting them. Like we have like a little show off for complete. Um, it can either be stuff that you've designed or just printed. Uh, what is it? There's actually somebody posted something just the other day. Oh, uh, let me see if this is it. I got to look. I got it up on my other screen. It was just the other day that I like was very, very, very interested in. Let's see if I can find it. Um, no, I'm not I'm not seeing it. I don't know. Pre people are printing a lot of cool things. Um, so some of the most recent ones was uh, Zombie Hedgehog printed uh, with one of our brand new materials. So there was, uh, we, we, we came up with a new material. We, it was the Alex, the guy that was just doing some like R and D, um, like without prompting, he just mixed two other materials together. Um, he mixed like a shiny blue and uh, really 
uh, fluorescent red together. Um, and it made this like shiny weirdish purple color. And we asked him what color he wanted to name it and he called it Blupiter. So we listed it as Blupiter and it was the dumbest name that we came up with, but everyone loved it. Um, but we had only printed one test part before That's sending awesome. it out, which is really rare. Usually we test uh, a lot before we actually launch anything. Um, and uh, Zombie Hedgehog got uh, a roll of it and then he printed this uh, this skull and I'm probably not going to be able to show that, but um, it was really cool to see like all of the highlights and lowlights, like stuff that I have not seen uh, and in the actual film itself because I haven't printed with it a whole lot. So that was a really cool print. Right, right. So was that in the, it was a skull, it was in the uh, show off prints area? Yep, it was on uh, I was trying to see February 11th. Little, uh, favorite. There it is. Yep. Hold on. I wonder if there I we go. Put on here. That one right there. That's it. Yep. Yeah. It just looked a lot there cooler than I thought it would. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So that's in Blupiter is what you're saying. Yeah. We, we get hung up on names a lot. So sometimes I'm just like, you know what? We're going to give it a stupid name, something that will force us to change yeah. it and then we'll change it. <laughs> but now everyone's saying that they like the name. So I don't know if we're going to, I keep Blupiter. I, I don't know. That's a pretty good name. That's a pretty good name. So now, of of the filaments you make and sell, let's mm -hmm. I'll I'll narrow it down. Of the filaments you make, what is your favorite filament? Um, let's see. Ray says keep the name. By the way, keep the name. Thank you for the likes, guys. While he's thinking, I'm going to say thank you for the likes. Keep tapping. Thank you for the gifts. Really, really appreciate that. Y'all just y'all have no clue. Um, you know, this is our show. Uh, y'all helped me with this show so much. Thank you. What did you come up with? Uh, I think I like the one that we call bubblegum. Um, bubblegum was made kind okay. of by mistake. Um, but we, we made a lot of fluorescent colors. And I the, the thing that kills me the most is I do not know how to take a picture of a fluorescent roll of filament, even if it's not glowing in black light. I cannot take a picture where it looks cool on the website so a weird thing is like fluorescents don't sell a lot on our website but anytime that we go to like a convention or something they sell out like instantly because they're just extremely extremely vibrant colors in real life um even if they're not being like glowing or anything they just it's like a safety yellow vest like when you're seeing a construction um company or something and they're all in like those really bright there's like really aggressively bright uh vests it's it's stuff like that but there's uh, our magenta color, and then we uh, lightened it up, and it looks like bubble gum, but it's like a really aggressive bubble gum color. So um, it really aggressive pops. Bubble. Yeah, aggressive bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that the one you had? Um, that's not the one you had the contest for, right? No, actually, the one the that I have the contest for, I got uh, that one's still like in the back burner because they uh, the supplies that they got for it, the company that actually made that pigment went out of business. So like the one that like actually supplied that. So it's still in the works, but I think it's now, I don't know, seven or eight months or something um, is where that is. So um, the closest that I can get to it right now is our magenta color. So I got teased with the uh, the electric I think electric watermelon or something is what we we're nicknaming it. Yeah. Based on one of those comments. So I'm kind of getting to that point where like, I still have that email. I have an email to myself from back when we were doing that. And I'm like, Hey, remember to send a spool of filament of electric watermelon to the winner of the person that named it. And I'm about to just be like, Hey, pick one of the other colors of filament. I like the name a lot, but it might be a while before it actually hits the shelves. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Hey, let's offline. Let's talk about getting that shot. Uh, I've got some ways you can do it. We'll talk. Alrighty. Okay. Um, guys, thank you so much for the likes. Uh, thank you for the gifts and everything. Thank you for the comments. Uh, passive aggressive bubblegum. I like that Luna. That's a good name too. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Is I have to fit them on a label. So I always try to make them as short okay. as I can. Aggressive bubblegum, eh, aggressive bubblegum would be small. Passive aggressive would be non-existent. <laughs> A yeah. bubble gum or something like that. Bubble gum. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Are you attending any of the Rep Rap festivals this year? Yep. Yeah. So I think the next one coming up is the Rocky Mountain Rep Rap Festival. Uh, so yep. that's on 420. Um, so I'll be there for that. I'll be there. I'm actually going early and staying late. So I don't have to worry about like waking up after one hour of sleep to go catch a flight or something. So I should be able to be relaxed at the event. So that's cool. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. I'll definitely see there. I'll be at that one. 
Um, I'm I'm kind of, I'll be skipping one of them this year. I'm I'm planning on trying to attend Open Sauce, and so I'm gonna have to give up one of the Rep Rat festivals to be able to make it to Open Sauce, and uh, so. <laughs> that as well. that was right, not that festival. The the festival on four twenty. You're right, not the same festival. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, all right, so guys, here's something I, I wanted to do this time. So, the past two interviews I've done, I've been called nerdy, and especially the last one. The last person I interviewed called me a really big nerd, and so. I have come up with a nerdiness test and we are going to give this nerdiness test to Mitch. All right. And then at the end, y'all get to choose whether he's nerdy or not. Okay. All right. We're going to, this is going to be a thing. This is going to be a thing. All right. So here we go. Nerdiness test. First question. How many digits of pi do you know? Oh, not very many. Um, I feel like I'm going to say I'm wrong. I'm going to count my head. Six, I think. Six, five for sure. Right. Six <laughs> okay. All right. What's your favorite TV show? Ooh, uh, I liked a show called Dark. It's a German show, um, so you can only watch it subtitled. But uh, it was one that messes with your head. Okay. Okay. So you like? Were you a big Black Mirror fan and all that? Do you, I like Black Mirror. Yeah. Is that kind? Of yeah, okay. Okay. So dark. Like okay. Okay. This is like a, I don't know. It was like a about time travel and paradoxes or something where people like a bunch of like timelines are like intertwining and you're only ever seeing like a bit of it. It almost feels like it's slowly zooming out and you're trying to piece these things together. But you really got to you got to be okay. fully aware to watch it. It's a thinker. <laughs> Ray Skullman says he's been having a bit of a slaughterhouse five crisis, so he can't watch dark right now. I don't know what that means. I'm sure you do. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite hobby? Hobby. Um, see, this is a tough one because my hobby turned into a business. So yeah. I'll try to pick something outside of the 3D printing world. Um, I'm trying to think what I even do outside of the 3D printing world. Um, honestly, I've been going back. So I, my background was software engineering, but then I started doing all this like hands-on stuff and I stopped programming. So now on weekends, I go to a coffee shop and I program and I really have a lot of fun when I go do that. So uh, it's like a little bit of software yeah, development awesome. is what I do for a hobby. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So if I start the phrase settlers of, how do you finish it? <laughs> huh? Catan. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I, have, um, I, think I have Settlers of Catan board game on my table right now. We were just playing it not too long ago. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Do you play any instruments? Uh, yeah, guitar and piano. All right. All right. Have you ever gelled your hair? Oh, yeah, every day. Okay. How do you feel about Harry Potter? Oh, how do I feel about Harry Potter? I've watched, I, I think we just watched the whole show like binge watched it earlier this year i think that might be the first time i've ever watched the entire thing all the way through um i like it but i'm i'm not a diehard fan by all means okay what's the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow well it depends african or european <laughs> all right all right all right i'll let you guys decide that's my questions um, I'll let you guys decide. You'll have to say, yes, he is. No, he isn't. And we'll, we'll, we'll figure that one out. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Mitch. Thank you for entertaining me and, and just being here. Uh, I'm going to give you a minute just to kind of drink a little bit, sit back, uh, kick back. I'm going to talk to the guys real quick. Um, thank you for the likes and shares, guys. Thank you so much. We're at 12K. That is really, really, really awesome. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, we were talking a minute ago about um, uh, the discords. Uh, you can jump in my bio, jump in his bio, you'll see the Discord. I'm also working on that list of places where 3D printers can get help. So if you jump in there and check out that list and you know of another place, uh, please send that to me so we can really, really build that list. I know I could do a poll, Luna. I just didn't feel like it. I could see the yeses and everything. <laughs> I can. I know there's a poll. I, um, I'll get faster at that one day. Um, 
so uh, la 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 value for value i talk about that all the time and so tonight a lot of y'all are spending we got the time talent and the treasure a lot of y'all are spending time thank you so much for jumping in thank you for the taps and likes talent um i'm always looking for people who are good at researching news who are good at kind of understanding the new technology that's coming uh when i do my normal kind of lives i'm looking for people who enjoy making graphics and stuff so we can just boost the quality of what's going on here so if you have a talent that you want to provide please reach out to me there's rooms in the discord I'm looking for people to teach knitting if anybody wants to teach knitting uh, but I'm just looking for people who want to add their talents to the community and then as far as the treasure part y'all know that the gifts there's other places in my bio where you can give to that and that always helps go towards the show probably going to end up buying a new broadcast PC at some point for this but um, I just really appreciate everything y'all do just remember this is our show Y'all feed me a lot of the ideas and things I get, I get from uh, some of y'all. Y'all send to me videos, y'all message me, y'all tell me things you're interested in. And that's where I can get a lot of ideas for the show. And so you're participating um, and you're just, you're a real, real, real big part of that. Um, I can like my, make lights turn green by staring at them. Yes, that helps. Maybe you can stare at my internet and make it work better. Uh, if you want to do that, that's a beautiful talent uh, that I would really, really appreciate. Appreciate. Um, but thank you guys. So one of the things about tonight that I want you all to understand about Mitch, you know, in the 3D space, there are a lot of filament companies. And I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, some of those companies are better than others. I'm sorry to break it to you. Some filament companies are better than other filament companies. Um, and so you'll get to learn a lot about Mitch and kind of this next section about why Mitch Phil Mitch's filament is the way that it is. And we're going to kind of go through and discuss some of this. I printed out all my notes because I'm uh, so well, my computers are so goofed up tonight. So I'm reading. Um, and then before we get into the questions, last thing, I've always promised to start reading the people who watch the most and give the most. Y'all may not care, but I want to give you a shout out, guys, uh, since y'all do support the show. So when it comes to the highest gift amount in the last seven days, I always do that. So Lee Shepard, Lee David, Brady Prince. Oh, you're going to make me say this name. Ed Skildenson Creative Works. There you go. I said it wrong. Ben Pendergast, uh, Luna 3D Creations, Nate's Print Shop. Spicoli 3D, Crafty Labs 3D, and Kawaii Rogue Lindsay. Thank you guys. A lot of those guys are in this room watching right now. Follow them, like them, go watch their videos, like everything in their video section, and just uh, I really appreciate what those what everybody does for me. Then we've got our highest watch time. Now our highest watch time of the last seven days, Kaylin Laterra, Crafty Labs 3D. TikTok on the Coke. I have to say the names, guys. I have to say the names. Spicoli 3D, Texas Leo, Brady Prince, gotta say it again, Eskildson Creative Works, Lee David, Cheesy Chains, and Nate's Print Shop. <laughs> thank you guys thank you so so much for that i really really appreciate that thank you for the gifts again thank you for the cap that's awesome if y'all notice i'm wearing a new cap my brother-in-law owns a farm and he gave me a baseball cap so i decided to wear it a little bit but um all right back to you mitch you ready let's do it um when i started talking with when I started talking with Mitch, he gave me a lot of topics he wanted to talk about, and I know a lot of them were things that y'all were interested in. Um, so in this next section, you're really going to understand a lot of what Mitch's passion is and the things that he really, really loves to do. So the first thing, I'm going to ask a lot of these in the form of questions. Some of these will be my questions, and some of these will be things that he, he talked about. But one of the things I've always wondered about in filament is why do we sell it by weight and not length yeah so there's a lot of topics that like I, I could talk for a long time and i might not have an answer for so this is like this is one of those and it's been like bothering me a lot recently um so for for reference the the reason i've been thinking a lot about this lately is because we're redesigning our spool right now um to work for uh, the ams 
So uh, when we came up with our first spool design ever, uh, we put very, I don't want to say very little thought into it. I just didn't really know what would make a good spool or not. So in my head, I'm like, okay, it's roughly this big and it needs to fit one kilogram of plastic on it. I didn't really think about like, oh, should I use a four inch core or should I use a 3.77 inch core? Like I didn't really think that there'd be much of a difference between those two. Um, so we kind of just took like a shot in the dark, got something that worked and it worked for a couple of years. Uh, but now we're going back and we're revisiting that uh, kind of inspired by bamboo printers because um, a lot of cardboard spools don't work on bamboo lab printers, uh, specifically the AMS. Right. So now I'm going into a lot of detail into those really little things. And I, I put like a lot of detail in every single cut that's in our spool is there for a reason. Um, um, but specifically the one that's interesting is uh, weight versus length, uh, because um, whenever we're winding onto a spool, um, eventually it's going to get overflowed. Um, so I have to pick a spool that's big enough that it can hold a full kilogram, um, but small enough that it's cheap to ship, that you can fit it on all of your printers, um, that is compatible with everything else that's out there. Um, but as we're doing like different materials, uh, it's kind of funny because like uh, ABS uh, will like overflow on our new spool because it takes up a lot more space, uh, whereas PLA will be nice and um, condensed. And uh, something I was thinking about though is I think it's really weird uh, that we use weight instead of length. And that's because when we make filament, I don't have a way to weigh it until it's done because it's, it's winding, it's actively winding, there's forces on it, I can't put it on a scale. Um, so how do we get the weight? Well, we measure the length with just a rolling wheel. Um, we know what length equals one kilogram. And then when we're done, we can snip it, we can cut it off and we double check ourselves by putting it on a scale. Um, but really we're just doing it by length. And if we're off by like a little bit, like if we're a little heavier, a little light, um, then we change that length uh, to account for that. But it's also kind of weird because 3D printers don't care about weight either. So like when you slice something, it will tell you how much weight you're using, but it doesn't really know the weight. It really knows the length. It knows how many tool paths it has to move. It measures that length. And then you say how dense the filament is. You type in like 1.24 grams per centimeter cubed, and then it calculates the weight. So I just thought it was funny that we make it by length, you use it by length, but for some reason we do everything with weight instead. Well, and, and I go to Home Depot and I buy rope or electrical wire or everything is by length. It's not by weight. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's something I've definitely been wondering as well. Uh, so I think that's interesting. So we really don't have a reason. We just do it. Is that what you're saying? Did anybody who started it first? Yeah, uh, do we I, don't, know? I don't know where it came by from like, I've been doing a lot of digging into like the early days of filament. Um, mostly it's dominated by Stratasys uh, from the early days. They had a lot to play with it. Um, I don't really know where the one kilogram exact came from. Like, I don't know why we specifically chose that over something else. Um, I do know that like, when we've priced out what it would cost for us to make a half a kilogram spool, it only saves like $2. So like it's at that point where you might as well spend $2 more and get double the filament or something. Um, you want it to be big enough that it's worthwhile for us to make, um, small enough that it can still ship easily. So it's kind of like, it's, it's in a nice sweet spot that it's one kilogram, um, but I don't know why we chose one kilogram instead of length, so. Okay. All right. Uh, Zoidberger says he enjoys watching your lives while you're spooling and distracting you. Oh yeah. That was fun. I <laughs> do mean, they I try do to distract you all the time? <laughs> I, I don't run the line very often. So when I do, I, I don't okay. like stream it um, and just kind of like hung out because I was bored and I was like the only one in the building. So there's nothing else to do. But, okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's all that whole end actually, since, uh, since that stream has all been ripped apart and rebuilt now, uh, to account for new larger spools. So it's a completely different winder than it used to be. Oh, okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, so based on, based on that, the length versus the weight, there's actually some like different filaments that you're really not paying, you're paying less for because of weight, right. Versus length. So like in the ABS is like not as heavy as PLA. And so you're really getting more ABS for your buck than you would PLA. Yeah. So like that kind of how that works. Yeah. If you're measuring like how many prints, like if you're like, how many benches can I get out of one spool of filament? Uh, PLA is 1.24 grams per centimeter cubed, whereas ABS is 1.02. Um, so just throwing some math out, I had this pre-calculated. Um, ABS is 82% 
the weight of PLA. So it's lighter, um, which means that like you're getting 18% more material per kilogram, if that means anything. So you'll get 18% more benchies out of a one kilogram spool of PLA than you will, or sorry, PETG than you will PLA. Um, so if you're measuring your oh, per benchy, then it would be like you're getting a pretty significant discount, honestly. So that's one of the other reasons that I think it's just kind of weird that like, I would like to get the same number of benchies per spool, regardless of the material, because it sets a much easier bench line instead of having to get out a calculator and do math. And then one other thing is, I know not everyone has this luxury, but um, being able to weigh the actual filament that you get and then being able to measure the length of it. One shortcut that I've been seeing a lot more is since we sell everything by one kilogram weight, basically, if you want to cheap out or skimp on something, the best thing that you can do is make your filament as heavy as possible, because if you make it heavier, then you have to sell less of it. Um, so there's a lot of fillers and additives that can be put in that specifically are really, really dense and they weigh a lot more and then you get much shorter lengths. So I've seen lengths that are like up to like usually like 10 to 13 percent shorter than natural PLA. Um, so that's just one of the shortcuts. It's the one phrase I like to say is um, when a metric becomes a target, it fails to be a good metric. So a metric would be one kilogram is what we use for that. But now since everyone uses that metric, um, then it becomes a target and everyone's like, okay, now how can I, how can I hit that one kilogram mark as cheaply or easily as possible? And now it no longer right. is a good metric anymore. Well, and you had sent me some pictures on additives that people are using um, as far as like the water and the concrete, people are actually putting concrete in peel in, in filament. Uh, that's concentrate. No, not concrete, oh, concrete that I know of. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. People use weird stuff all the time. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that picture is, uh, more for like the PLA versus PLA plus topic. Um, those uh -huh. are different fillers or additives that you can mix in. Um, and additives come in all shapes and sizes. So that's those were uh, the, the four examples. There's uh, the ones that I've worked with are powders, liquids, concentrates, and then just other plastics. So mixing combinations of those, you can get different results out of it. Okay. Okay. Let's see. We got to just see if there's any questions. We got uh, is white filament heavier? I think you mentioned it's little rocks. If so, could you add white as a way to do that? I don't understand the question. Um, so you're Somebody, talking about white. So white is made from titanium dioxide, which is technically a rock. Um, no, it's not really much heavier because like when you do colorant, colorant is so small compared to everything else. Like it's usually half a percent to uh, like two percent. Um, so it might adjust it a little bit, um, but there's so little in it that it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So technically, maybe yeah, it's heavier, but not negligibly. Neg yeah, negligibly. Okay. Um, is there a way to tell how much filler is in a filament or you're just, you get what you get and you yeah. move on? As a hobbyist, not really. Um, as like a reverse engineer, you can actually do like burn tests, melt flow indexes. So like burn tests are where you basically light it on fire. All the organic material burns away and anything that's inorganic is left behind. Um, so basically you can just see the ratios that are left behind compared to uh, regular and I guess, filled uh, okay. materials. Uh, um, that being said, not all fillers are bad. So a lot of, I, actually, I should say additives. Um, additives are anything that you add into the filament to change a property about it. For example, like color is an additive. You're changing the like visible look of the filament. There's things that you can add to make it stronger or moisture resistant. Um, and then a subset of additives that their whole goal is to make it cheaper those are usually referred to as fillers. That's just kind of like, how can I just like pump material into this just to lower the cost? Um, so basically, if you do any of those tests that I was just mentioning, um, you'll you'll see like residues left over, you'll find different materials. Um, those would just be whatever additives are added into it, which may or may not always be a bad thing. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to melt plastic and plastic is a thermal insulator, which means that it doesn't want to melt. So there's things that you can add into it to make it want to melt. Um, so. Of course, that's going to like throw off any little tests that you do. But yeah, it's very difficult to figure out what if there's fillers, let alone what fillers they are. Very, very difficult to reverse engineer. OK, OK, awesome. Um, Pet G, this is something I've always. Why is Pet G so expensive? I feel like it should be the cheapest filament of all. It's used so much. 
Our pet is used so much, and we're adding adding propylene glycol to it. What what makes it so expensive? Uh, so our pet G resin is a lot cheaper than our PLA resin. The base cost of it. Um, so it is cheaper. It's way more popular. Um, that being said, there's a lot of different PETs and PETGs that, that are out there. Um, so like I broke a screw that was hanging up above my desk at work because I had two different grades of PETG and I mixed them up. Um, so one melted at 270 C and the other one melted at 210 C. So I had my screw too cold and it snapped. Um, but anyway, um, most of like our prices are based on supply and demand. Um, because anytime that I switch materials, I have to clean out the entire screw. I have to do a lot of maintenance on it to basically get it r ready to make sure that there's no like, re like PLA in your pet G after we go from PLA to pet G. And if I go from pet G back to PLA, I want to make sure there's no re like residual pellets in there. Um, and it's a pretty intensive process to do that. So from like our end, um, PLA is way more popular. So most days go by, I just run PLA after PLA after PLA after PLA after PLA. I don't have to add that extra labor step of like basically ripping the entire machine apart. Um, but anytime I switch to pet G I do, and I'll rip everything apart, make a day or two's worth of pet G and then go right back to PLA after that. Um, so if people were buying pet G as much as they're buying PLA, uh, then basically all the optimizations and cost cutting things would start to apply to that. Um, I would keep a larger inventory. I keep a way smaller inventory of PETG just because it sits on the shelf a lot longer than PLA does. Um, and I, I think that's just mostly because like from our end, we see that the most, like the people that buy the most stuff are like beginners. There's a lot of beginners getting into it. And if you were to find someone new in 3D printing and they're like, hey, what material do you recommend? If you tell them to start with PETG, then you're giving them terrible advice. Like definitely get started with PLA to um that's how i started yep. <laughs> i came into 3d printing with pet g oh, nobody told oh, me not to and so out. i fought and fought learned how to print pet g now everything else is so easy yep. Uh, yep. but yeah i was from our and that's all it is it is cheaper it is a cheaper plastic to get and there's no reason like nothing actually makes it more expensive to make other than the fact that it's less common okay okay um do you see a lot of people wanting uh, things at, coming up, other things like pet GCF or any other just kind of special. Do you get a lot of requests for interesting things? Yeah. So I'm going to plug the Discord here because so, um, we've got a section for future products. So we've got on our Polar Filament Discord, there's like these are all the, you're not going to be able to see it, but they're just like yeah. things that are requested and then you vote with emojis and whatever has the highest emoji is what we do next. Um, so right now the, the choices are ABS, more colors of PETG, 2.85 millimeter filament, ASA, TPU, novelty PLA, like sparkly, glowy, um, PLA plus, um, nylon versus nylon carbon fiber, and then sample packs. And the highest rated one right now is novelty PLA. So out of all the PLA we make, the most requested thing is more PLA. So that's okay. one of the reasons why we have so much PLA is it's just like people can't sense. Sense. But... It does. It does. Hey, thank you guys. Thank you for the likes. 14.1K. I can't believe it. Uh, I know I say it a lot, but I really appreciate what y'all are doing. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for all of that. Uh, hey, you, you sent me a picture of your rolls. Now this is one of your older rolls. And you said you're reworking your roles right now. Um, what is, you said a little bit of it's because you want them to fit in the bamboo. Are there other particular reasons that you're doing it? And that's an old and new role. Yeah, so the, the old role is the one that's black and then the new one is the one that's like tan. Um, the old one is like a stereotypical cardboard. Um, it was kind of weak, it was flimsy. Um, it was, I mean, it's eco-friendly cause you can, you can burn it there. The glue has no, uh, it doesn't release any formaldehyde when it's burned for anyone that's actually out there burning your cardboard spools. Um, but anyway, like that, that was kind of like a good starter. Um, it was easy for us to get locally. Um, but now that I've had more time, um, we saw like some of the downsides of bamboo lab printers is that with the cardboard spools as they're rolling, uh, we did not design our original spools to roll. So they would kind of like crumple a little bit, just like any cardboard spool would. Um, so this new one is a much more rigid material. It's more of like a composite, um, but it's still burnable. It still doesn't release any chemicals. Um, it's got a burnished edge because they're all laser cut. Um, so now it's uh, 
it, it has grip. It doesn't just like create any powders or residues or anything like that. Um, it was heavily inspired by Bamboo Lab printers, like making it work for that. Um, it's also a little bit smaller because our old one, when we were coming up with the diameter, we're just like, I don't know, roughly this big. And that came out to eight inches. Well, it turns out that eight inches, when you convert that to metric, is like 203 or 204 millimeters. And the maximum size for a Bamboo Lab printer is 200 millimeters. So we were like four millimeters off, two millimeters on each end. So I had to just shave <laughs> off two millimeters on each end for the new one. So that way it could actually fit in and close the lid. Um, so there was things like that. Um, the old material I didn't like because uh, sometimes when things are like tossed around and shipping a lot, um, they, they take a, a big beating and the spools themselves are basically like a bunch of, we'll call them like thin sheets of paper that are compressed together with glue. Um, and no matter how much glue we would put to, to hold the core onto it, they would rip off and tear the spool off with it. It wasn't the glue that was failing, it was the, the spool side itself. So this new composite material is a lot stronger and it doesn't rip off like that like if you're if you pull it until it breaks the whole thing is going to like explode because it, it doesn't just disintegrate like the old one did so strength reliability packaging they're asking about the things. ams light <laughs> they're asking about the ams light AMS have y'all tested it on that yeah ams light everything works great both of our spools do i like the ams light awesome. i think that's cool because like it grabs from the center of the spool instead of the out side part of the spool which is i think how most manufacturers load their spool like we wind it by using the core in the center so the center slot is way more standardized than the outer diameter of the spool um so it's just kind of like i don't know it seems like they designed it around how people are actually making filament instead of whatever they did last time i mean they, they were a game changer so kudos for that but the, the ams light the mounting technique i think from my end is way way nicer I think people can use more okay. stuff out of the box too like that. They don't have to print adapters for it or compatibility issues. But. Yeah, well, that's cool. That is cool. Hey guys, thank you. Keep tapping, keep liking. Hey, do you mind if we go a little longer? Do you have to go? Do you oh, have I'm to rough. run? At this time, I okay, can't guys. at a time. Last time I stayed at work and I was like, man, it's getting kind of late to be here at work, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm home. I've got nothing else going on. Okay, awesome. Guys, y'all mind if we keep going? Let me know. Y'all mind if we, we keep going? Y'all got to stick with me if we keep going. All right. All right. I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, there we go. We got to keep going. Um, now, one of the things I definitely wanted to talk to you about, I'm really starting to get into Hue Forge, and I'm trying to understand all of the the terminology and all the different things going on. And I know you and I have actually talked about it before uh, when it came, when it comes to like transmission distance and light path, blah, 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 all those really weird words that they use in Hue Forge. But um, can you kind of give us a little idea of what people are talking about when they talk about transmission distance and the things you need to look for in a filament for Hue Forge? Yeah, so uh, transmission distance is new. Um, and it's a thing that's meaning new, meaning it wasn't, it, it's always existed, but it's been something that no one has cared about up until recently. Um, and transmission distance is like, uh, imagine that you're printing, if you print, print a layer of black uh, PLA and then you print a lighter color on top of it, like yellow. If you print one layer of yellow, it's gonna come out to be like a, a dark yellow because some of that black is gonna kind of bleed through that first layer. If you print another layer of yellow on top of it, it will look more yellow and less black. And after you do a few more layers, then it will completely blot out the black layer underneath it and it will be just its pure yellow color. Um, so essentially the transmission distance is how thick do you need um, to kind of print in order for all of that light to essentially disappear. And um, by taking advantage of that, you can kind of combine colors to make in between colors. So even though you only have black and yellow, you could actually do halfway. You could have a dark yellow by combining uh, those two. And if you put one color on top of the other one, you get one set. And if you flip them around, you get a different set. Um, total disclaimer, I have not used Hue Forge myself. I am regurgitating stuff I've seen off of the internet. So I'm probably going to be saying a lot of things wrong here. Um, but I've taken approach from like the manufacturing side of things. Um, so that's something that once again has always existed. And uh, it, every filament has always had that property, but like once again, people didn't care about it. They looked at it and said, that's a, a nice yellow. Uh, you could look at two yellows that look identical and you're just like, oh, those look like the same yellow. But if you print with one, one might be a little bit more opaque than the other one. 
Um, so now that Hue Forge is getting popular, one of the things is to kind of measure that transmission distance so that way you can kind of predict um, what your result is going to look like. You can take advantage of it. You can uh, layer different um, thicknesses on there to get different shades. Uh, and they're phenomenal effects. Like it, it blows me away every single time that I see somebody post something that they print with Hue Forge. Um, so across spools, that transmission distance across spools, is that a consistent thing? Or is that when you're saying we got to start testing for that, that's what you're looking for? Yeah, so I cannot speak to other manufacturers. I can speak for a few manufacturers because in addition to us making polar filament, we do make it for other brands as well. Um, but I can't say who those people are, but um, I know what the process is and it's a lot more laid back than you'd think. Um, so like, uh, once again, there has been no measurement for transmission distance. There has been no need for it to be consistent between batches. Um, so we typically have colorant recipes, but the colorant recipes change occasionally. Um, they change in a way that we make sure that they're visibly the same and that they have the same like color when they're actually done, but we do not measure transmission distance because no one cared to measure it in the first place. Um, so that is something that over, I actually got a license for Hue Forge just to join the Discord channel to say hi, um, and I was I just wanted to see what um, was going on for uh, transmission distance measuring, um, and it was a while ago, but I think they were just launching uh, a, a sensor that you could put some filament into, and it would ideally tell you what the actual transmission distance is for it, um, and just from our own like testing, it's surprisingly dis, dis different between batches um things can just happen i mean if we make filament on a humid day versus a dry day um some pellets will stick to the walls of things and they won't be as concentrated anymore so it will be such a small amount that it'll still come out the same color um but that could probably affect transmission distance and i don't have a way to measure it granular uh, at the moment so i don't have a definitive answer but um Something that is kind of in progress right now is building a transmission distance sensor to measure uh, the TD for every single spool that's coming off. Not not just for every spool, but also for within the spool. So like we could graph the transmission distance just like how we graph the tolerance. Um, so that's something that I probably won't know the definitive answer to until it's actually all up and running, hooked up, and we run a few spools. And even when I have the answer, I'll just be able to say this is what it is for us. So... I got that. I got that. Hey guys, thank you for the likes. Keep those going if you can since we're going longer. Let's get more people coming in and everything. I'm seeing your questions. I'm writing them down. Brady, I know you've asked a question. I'm going to get to yours a little bit later on. Um, I got a couple of other guys. Now, somebody was asking, do the pigments, do you think a pigment affects the transmissibility? Is it the additives? Is it a combination of a lot of things? What are you discovering? Um, I've discovered a lot actually. So yes, pigments do affect it. Um, one thing that's really common is titanium dioxide is added into uh, filaments to make them more opaque. So basically that's all in the colorants and stuff like that. So um, that will make sure that's the difference between whether or not you get a, a spool that's like translucent or transparent, one that is a solid color. Um, but on top of that, something that's a challenge is even surface finish is going to affect how you measure the TD of a strand of filament. So you could make the exact same filament if one comes out rough on the outside and one comes out like smooth and glossy. If you're using a transmission distance sensor, you're going to get two very different results, even though when you melt it down, it will turn into the exact same thing. Um, so that's definitely a challenge or something that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, humidity also has a lot to do with it. So if you dry or don't dry your filament, um, something that I've really enjoyed is if I take, um, I actually had a really extreme case today. I wonder if I can find it. Um, this is for pet G. Oh, here it is. This is probably not going to show up, but if you don't dry material at all, those are air bubbles <laughs> that you can see in there from, uh, or rather moisture bubbles um, from the, the humidity boiling and creating bubbles in the filament. Um, so the more you dry it, the smaller and smaller those get. Um, and even if you think that everything is dry, um, you can still take like a strand of PLA or PETG and put it under a microscope and you can see those like microscopic bubbles. And um, those will affect the opacity as well as the transmission distance of the filament. Um, so that, that's something to take into consideration. It's pretty easy to dry your filament well. I mean, it's, it's a math equation for how long you need to dry it to get it to a target temperature, but it's cool to 
go from the R and D side. Like whenever we purge something, we just kind of like grab a scoop and pour it in. We don't like dry it. So any type of time that we just like purge stuff, it's always like bubbly and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. That's cool. And I know there's a whole thing around drying filament and, and all that. We won't get into that too much, but that's yeah. drying filament is always interesting in the discussions and, and all that behind there. Um, maybe another day, <laughs> That's a but I know a lot of those questions are probably about to come. Um, so do you see with all of this, with like the transmissibility and uh, just all the sustainability stuff that people are focusing on in, in the background of creating filament, are you seeing like chemists or specialized people starting to crop up in the area of filament creation? Are you seeing anything like that? Uh, it's, I'm not mostly just because filament is very new in the grand scheme of things. And right now it's more like the, the most important things to solve, at least from my end, are the manufacturing ends of things. So like, how can you make things consistent between batches? Uh, it doesn't matter as much about like the, the, the basically the sciency part of it as much as like, can you make a business case? Can you make a certain number of spools every day? Can you sell a certain number of spools every day? Um, can you make sure that they're consistent? Can you make sure that it's repeatable if you're doing it on a different machine? So it's more of just like the, the manufacturing hurdles. Um, I'm sure once that kind of like all cools down, then there will be an opening for more of those like, I don't know, we'll say like the chemistry or the more sciencey type things to um, finally start taking hold. But like, there's a lot more important things that are kind of pressing right now. I mean, people have probably gotten, uh, I mean, trying two different brands of filament or whatever, you can get two completely different results. So like until that starts to normalize, um, there might not be a demand quite for it yet, but I don't know. I could okay. probably eat those okay. words later on. <laughs> now, and I've asked you this question before, but we had this one in the room. Are you working on your own CYMK? Um, no, not actively. I have, we have <laughs> uh, a cyan that's pretty close to cyan, a uh, yellow that's pretty close to true yellow, and um, um, magenta that is magenta, and then a black that could be blacker, but uh, it's pretty black. So like, basically we've hit really, really close to true CMYK, but like, we didn't specifically go out to do that. So if I do make something that is like a true CMYK, it will probably be unnoticeable to anyone. Like if I put the, the correct blue next to the blue that we have, it'll be like unnoticeable. So I don't really know how deep people are getting. Um, if you want to look, or the blue that I'm talking about, the cyan is called light blue. Um, the yellow is, our, is called uh, lemon drop and the magenta is called magenta. <laughs> so those are the three colors. You can put them all next to each other if you want to see what they look like. Um, they're, they're pretty spot on. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I wrote those down for myself. So awesome. Um, see, the printers are finally fast. Oh, that and that's that brings up the next thing as far as like, we're moving into that appliance world and fast printer world and you know i've messed with a few things and uh you know courtney and i have played with some stuff and you notice sometimes with a filament thank you for the finger hearts i'm gonna do that hard 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 um but I, I you notice a lot of times when things slow down they're shinier when they're faster they're matte when they're, there's a lot of variations that happens with speed and what you're doing it most of what i do is i do prototyping so speed is not a big thing for me i want slow and durability that's what i'm gunning for so what what are things you think about in there kind of give me those conversations between the the low and the high speed yeah, so the, I mean, this is something very new. Once again, it has always existed, but it hasn't mattered. Um, basically, since like, I don't know, the beginning that I can remember of filament, everything had a recommended print temperature, which is usually a range of like five to 10 degrees or something like that, um, in order to kind of get the best print quality. Well, you used to be able to say like, hey, print everything at 210 C because uh, everyone was printing roughly at the same speed. And now that everyone's printing faster, it's introducing a new challenge, which is the, the temperature that you're setting your nozzle to is not the temperature of the filament coming out of it. The temperature that you're setting your nozzle to is the stuff that's trying to heat up the filament. The filament will approach that temperature, but it will never actually hit it. Um, so the faster that you're pushing stuff through, um, basically you're not giving your filament long enough to actually heat up. 
um, in order to actually hit that uh, temperature. So one of the like cheating ways is to just crank your temperature up. So you're gonna print at a much higher like nozzle temperature, um, but the, the plastic that's actually flowing out is still reaching the same temperature as if you're printing slower and colder. Um, and that was something that it's become a, a bit of a challenge here because uh, people that are new to polar filament are always asking for like recommended uh, print settings. Um, so they're saying like, hey, what temperature should I print at? And then I'll usually spit out like the answer that's on our label. And then they'll tell me that they're printing on a bamboo printer at 400 millimeters a second. And I'm like, okay, well, you're going to have to really crank that up. And it's kind of turning into this weird like math equation. Um, so I've kind of got ranges on our like data sheets and stuff like that. And it's making me think that it would not surprise me if a new metric popped up um, probably in the next like year or two. Instead of saying print temperature, it'll be something like thermal conductivity or something like that. Um, so a different way that's measured, which will then scale with uh, your speed. Um, because even, even just with PLAs, um, all PLAs are not the same. We can add different things into it, additives, fillers, uh, that will basically conduct heat, which will then make the, the material melt faster. Um, so it's not just as simple as what the temperature is, but also the thermal conductivity, how fast you're pushing it through. So uh, that's, that's something I don't know the answer to, but it's well, something I'm watching closely. Yeah, I've, even, I've even noticed a difference between like, I had, I finally got a bamboo and I have a ton of pet G. Uh, and so I just started printing pet G on the bamboo and was having some success at first, but then I started running across filaments that I had to raise the temperature all the way up to like 270 280 to get it to even print properly and uh, uh thank you tooling lee he, he helped me figure that out um you know it's, and it's really interesting how the faster you get the differences in the filament really start making a huge difference in in how the print is going um that that's that's cool that's cool um let's see now, I saw a question. What was that question? Let me jump in there. Okay, I think this one feeds into another, like max volumetric flow between something like fast PLA and standard PLA. What are you, are there things you're discovering there? Uh, numbers you could push or anything? Yeah, that gets kind of into the PLA versus PLA plus discussion a little bit. Um, I'm gonna give the abbreviated version on this. Um, PLA is a resin, uh, it's just a chemical formula. Um, and it is, I guess if you get it pure, then it's just like a uh, one, one chemical formula, I guess. Uh, but anyway, as you start making that, it's uh, pretty expensive. PLA is one of the more expensive resins that I've ever had to deal with. Uh, resins are just the pellets, by the way. Um, right. So like ABS is way cheaper, ASA is way cheaper, PETG is way cheaper. Um, so PLA is just expensive. So after everybody started selling filament, um, when I was getting started, it was like 30 bucks a spool for the cheap stuff. Um, and then everyone was kind of looking for a way to make it even cheaper. Um, so you could improve like your efficiencies and stuff for processing, but eventually you're gonna hit that base cost of what does this plastic itself cost? And everyone was kind of bottoming out there. Um, so one of the ways that you can make it cheaper is to add fillers into your materials. And fillers are just, there's just uh, like I was saying earlier, it can be a powder, it can be a liquid, it can be a concentrate, it can be a different plastic. Uh, the whole purpose is just find a way to reduce the cost of it. Um, so that kept getting added in and adding in and adding in, and then everything started dropping. So spools were going from 30 bucks a spool to 25 bucks a spool to 20 bucks a spool, and then they were hitting like $15 a spool. And basically, there's not really a limit, I should say, to how much filler uh, you're able to add in. Um, the properties will change over time. So the more you add, the more it will degrade. Um, you can usually get away with like a decent amount of filler before you notice any property change at all. But eventually, if anyone remembers, uh, it was probably like 2017 to 2019, if I had to guess, it was probably rock bottom for filament, um, where like so much filler was being added that it was so common that you would just buy a spool of plastic and it would just like disintegrate in your hands. It would just like fall apart. And that was just because everyone went a little bit too far on the filament or a little bit too much, a little too far on the filler, I'm sorry. And that was where uh, PLA plus was born. So everyone was like, okay, we need to back it off. We need to add less filler, uh, but somehow we need to market it as a good thing. So basically they like used to add, I, I can't say exact numbers per se, um, but just by backing it off to be not as aggressive, then they were marketing it as PLA plus. And it was like, hey, this is, uh, 
This is better than our existing PLA. And that naming convention kind of took off. Um, it wasn't regulated. No one's marketing, like no one defines what PLA versus PLA plus is. Uh, I see very different things. I see some brands that have PLA with a lot of filler that they call PLA and then PLA with less or no filler that they call PLA plus. I see other brands that have pure PLA and they call it PLA and then they add truly better compounds into it to really make it better and they call that PLA plus. But then you have that situation where one brand's PLA is a different brand's PLA plus. There's no one that can really tell it apart. No one's going to release their formulas. Um, so all of this kind of goes back to uh, the, the speed printing as well. Um, so there's different okay. additives. Basically, you're, you're adjusting how the, the um, specifically thermal conductivity is of plastic. So uh, plastic does not want to melt. It's, a, it's an insulator. Um, it does not want to conduct heat. It doesn't want to spread heat. Um, so you can add things into it to make it want to do that. Um, but there's also things that you can add into it that make it even more so like that, more plastic. So some cheaper uh, PLAs have just been loaded up with fillers and some brands will basically, once again, remove those fillers, makes it easier to melt, and then they'll market it as PLA plus or speed PLA or uh, like max flow or whatever. Um, there's a few things that you can add to increase uh, the thermal conductivity in a good way without making it, um, I don't know, without making it worse. Uh, I haven't found anything that's like very eco, like, uh, like economical, meaning like it, it's pretty darn expensive. So like the stuff that I've done that makes it cool, not faster, would increase the cost by quite a bit. Um, so I, I haven't gone down that route, so I can't speak too much to the experience of it. Um, the only thing that I can say is I've maxed out printers. Uh, I use a Voron uh, here at home and I maxed out like our filament compared to just some Amazon brand filaments. And right off the bat, ours can go like way, way, way faster. So that just leads me to believe that it's a filler related thing. Um, and we didn't do anything to it to change it. That's just what kind of natural PLA is. Um, so if you're ever curious, if you're ever trying to look for like a benchmark and you want to say like, hey, does this have um, additives that make it better or fillers that make it worse. Uh, right now, all of our PLA is just pure PLA. If you want to know what just melted down PLA pellets are like without any additives, that's, that's it's a decent benchmark to, to go off of. Okay. okay. That's, so do you ever like buy somebody's filament and go in the back room and test it to see what they put in it? Oh yeah, we put fill in there all the time. I mean, constantly. Because like, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. I'm, I'm terrified that I'm going to stop printing as much as I used to and kind of lose the connection of what I thought good filament was. And I'm already kind of hitting that with like bamboo lab printers because I've been so much into research that I haven't printed with uh, bamboo printers. I haven't printed with Hueforge. And those are some of the like most popular things right now. So I'm talking to a lot of people about it, but like all of the like advice and improvements are all kind of like secondhand at that point. They're not like my experiences so i've been making a big uh effort to like rotate what printer i take home and stuff like that and uh print just for fun um learning about it learning all the like whatever people are talking about i know like drying is a huge thing that everyone talks about and like speed printing is a really popular thing and then surface finish and like linear advance and all that kind of stuff so those are the things that i've been spending a lot of time on that's awesome. That is awesome. Now that's and that's some really good information. Got getting lots and lots of good comments. People just really uh, liking that information. Hopefully, one day that we'll come out with a definitive guide on drying filament or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm working, you know, because it, it's surprising. I mean, the the takeaway that I can say once again, it, it all comes back to fillers. Every single time, I get all excited about a route, and then it almost seems like it's always filler related. Um, but like PLA is pretty darn moisture resistant. Meaning if I don't dry other uh, pellets, like if I didn't dry PETG, it comes out like that. Like I was showing earlier, you can see all of the little air bubbles that are in it. If you don't dry PLA pellets and you extrude it, it looks totally fine. It looks exactly the same as regular stuff. So does that mean that it doesn't absorb moisture? Well, no, it, it still absorbs some moisture, but really, really, really low amounts. Um, that being said, as soon as you start adding fillers into it, then it starts to absorb a lot of moisture. So it's one of those things that, okay. once again, not all PLA is created equal. So I see two people arguing. One person is like, 
I never have to dry my stuff. And then someone else is like, if you don't dry it at all, then you, it's unusable. Um, and that's one of those right. things where from my end, I look at it, I'm like, you guys are probably both right. <laughs> like you're probably in the same situation. <laughs> situation. Uh, exactly. And, okay. and, well, why, does, know, why does the fill get, filament get more brittle when it brings moisture in versus getting more malleable? Why is it affected that way? Um, so PLA is a unique plastic in that even though it's not like compostable, meaning if you let it sit out, it will like disintegrate or whatever. Like it would be nice if you could toss it in like a compost bin and it turns into dirt. Um, it doesn't do that, but it still is a bioplastic and it still does actually start to break down. So anything that kind of accelerates that breakdown plastic or the, the breakdown process will start to make it more brittle. Um, so like anything that's like UV related, um, moisture changes. So when it gets like moist and then dry and then moist and then dry, that will start to kind of accelerate the breakdown process. Um, if you ever have a microscope that can see really deep, you can start to see all of uh, the breakdown actually starting to happen. It will look like little micro fissures and bubbles and stuff like that. Um, so it's if you ever had a print, it's probably going to go so slow you'll never notice it. Um, but anything that you do to raise temperature, raise light, raise humidity, it's just kind of accelerating that breakdown process. Okay. Okay. All right. Hey guys, thank you so much. Uh, wow. 23 K likes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the gifts. We actually hit our goal. I, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there were a couple of people behind that and I, I really appreciate what y'all are doing. Um, yeah, the, you know, that's the treasure part that I talk about all the time. And we're coming to a close here guys in a little bit. I have a few more questions. If you've got, um, any other questions, get them down in there in the comments. I'm kind of watching as we go. Um, so I talk to a lot of people in a lot of different industries. I do a lot of research uh, for myself on different things. And you've kind of hit on a few uh, things as far as what you're working on now. You know, I look at the manufacturing industry and so many of them are moving towards fabric. I look at uh, just different areas and everybody has what they think is coming next that they're really starting to look at. Do you have anything that you can share with or would want to share with us at what you are kind of looking at that might be coming down, uh, down the river? Yeah, so I actually just a few minutes before this, I cleared this with uh, everybody. So I was learning what I was allowed to say and what I wasn't allowed to say. So this is the what I'm allowed to say list. Um, so I was already talking about spools a little bit, um, how we're making those bamboo compatible. There's still little things that I want to change about it. So like those are still in the processes, working on making better spools. The, the thing that I'm changing now is the cores. Um, the next like big thing is Let's see if I can pull this up on uh, an iPad here. Uh, for anybody else that wants to check it out on your own, it's print.polarfilament.com. So, n2.com. So, this isn't particularly anything that's like new or novel. Here, I'll put it up like this. Um, this is our print quote tool. Um, so like you can upload a, a file or whatever. You can see some examples and stuff that are down in here. Um, and it's just like a, if you were to ever use a print service, then you upload a file, you select how you want to do everything. It's got like all the colors and stuff. Oops, colors. You can pick whatever color you want it to be. Um, and then it auto quotes everything. Um, but uh, we've been using that internally because I hated dealing with emails and people were emailing me saying like, hey, what's the status of our print? When is it gonna be done? How many are done? And it was just getting to the point where if we had like 50 jobs going on, I'd get 50 status update emails every single day asking when something was gonna be done. Um, so we made this tool um, internally for a long time. Um, and behind the scenes, what it does is it manages all of our print jobs. It sends out automated emails to say, hey, your order has been started. Um, it's like five out of 10 of them are printed. It's done, it's ready for pickup or it's shipping and stuff like that. And uh, we decided earlier this year, or a few months ago, that we were gonna launch this for the public as well. So anyone who runs their own print farm can set this up. And we've got a bunch of beta testers right now, kind of like ironing things out. You can set up your own pricing algorithms. Um, all the files are uploaded, it's mobile friendly and stuff. It takes care of all of your emails for you. Um, and it's really just to kind of solve all of the headaches that uh, we had had. So um, at this point, we're bringing on new uh, beta testers every week. Um, 
and we're trying out just kind of like bringing I'm onboarding more and more people seeing what little things we still have to tweak um constantly adding new little things i think we're planning a launch like an actual launch probably about a month or two from now um but anyway if uh anyone here uses a print farm and you want to join the beta testing all you got to do is join our discord channel and request that we'll uh put you in the beta testing there you go crap you you can get in there. That. <laughs> so yeah that's that's, that's cool kinda, that's kind of new that's one of the bigger things i spent a lot of time on that um asa is new um that was it's been requested by a bunch of people but we never had a real reason to do it because getting into a new material like you have to get a lot of material um but we finally had a big customer that on their own dominated that and basically secured the reason for us to get asa so we're getting asa um we tried out the first trial run the other day i'm not quite happy with it so i'm trying a different grade of material so i'll probably go through a few different grades until i find one that i'm happy with that we can get good tolerances and good printability with and then that'll roll out to the public as well um colors there's always just new colors but the next new colors are purple and shiny blue are the next uh I guess the next ones that are going to kind of be hitting the shelves um, and then big spools. So we got eight kilogram spools are the biggest ones. So we've gone from one to two and a half to three to five. And now we're at eight kilogram spools. They just keep getting bigger. Look at that. Look at that. That's like a wall mount. You put that on a wall. You need bricks for that one. That's awesome. 8K. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good that is pretty good well cool so purple plus shiny blue all right all right that's cool that's cool um any other questions guys we had something about uh something for a certain holiday uh oh so one question we had like sustainability when it comes to a filament company and everybody talks sustainability and that's such a to me such a buzzword and everything and it really comes down to because i could say i'm be have sustainable practices and everybody goes oh okay 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 as a company you know i like to know what what do you as a company do not using the word sustainability but how do you how do you recycle do blah blah well just kind of explain all that yeah so um one of the we ended up switching uh our base resin from nature works to uh Corbian specifically uh, because they are the first ones that have actually been able to make truly compostable um, or at least meet uh, compostable certifications. Now it's not something, once again, you can't set this stuff outside and have it degrade, but it can degrade in higher temperatures. So um, a good example is if you take uh, the basic PLA and you put it in like a hot water bath for like a week or something, it will like disintegrate back into a powder. Um, so like pretty much the thing that we do is we just try to like keep the right mindset when we're doing things um and like one really tough example was when bamboo was launching their bamboo ams um we needed a spool that worked out for it and basically the the moral of the story was cardboard spools did not work at all so like we had a cardboard spool so we were sitting there and we're like okay what should we do do we ditch the cardboard spool do we go to plastic spools just because this one company is out there doing that or do we spend a lot of time researching and see if we can find a way to make uh, a cardboard spool work? Uh, so we did that for or the second one there um, to try to find a way to make a cardboard spool that would work, going into it fully knowing that it could probably be a complete flop and that it might just have to give up and go to a, um, a plastic spool. Um, but after I... We have we have like the Hall of Fame at our building of how many different spools we've got. And I think it was like eight or nine or something revisions that we have done. Um, and we finally came up with the one that we have right now. It's still in the works, uh, but we were finally able to get something that works extremely reliably on the AMS, um, that it works consistently and that it's still at the end of the day, something that you can like throw away or compost or burn. Um, so there's just like a lot of little things like that, because I mean, what you do with the PLA is kind of up to you. So I mean, every spool that goes out is another kilogram of plastic. So um, in terms of recyclability, uh, PLA is really difficult to recycle. Um, and this is one thing that kind of bothers me a bit is uh, every every filament company that I've seen that pops up. One of the first things that they talk about is we're going to recycle plastic. We're going to make recycled spools. Uh, we did the exact same thing. We're like, hey, we're going to be brand new. We're going to do what no one else has ever done. And we're going to take scraps and we're going to turn it back into filament. Um, but it turns out that it's really challenging to do. 
um, because like you were saying earlier, how a PLA gets brittle uh, over time, um, that same thing happens on a microscopic level to your prints. And then when you take that and you melt it back down, you end up getting really inconsistent, bubbly or like breaky um, plastic, um, which is okay. It just comes out really bad and lumpy. And you can take that up and you can chop it up after that and mix it back in and re-extrude it a second time. And then it comes out much, much nicer. Uh, but the only problem is when you're buying filament, most of the cost that you're paying for is the labor that goes into making it. So when you have to do it twice, you're doubling the labor, which has a huge impact on the cost. So any sort of recycled plastic just costs a lot more to make. Um, we've offered some things that are along those lines where like something is a little bit more expensive and they just don't sell. So that's kind of where we are on that. At the end of the day, it's well, still a business. And you always have to end up having to add material to it so it can be more consistent, which makes it not fully recycled. And there's so many other things in there, but um, it's cool that you're you're trying, that you're pushing, that you're always thoughtful about that process. I think that's something all of us battle with. Uh, even when it comes to our homes, we're printing. What do we do with these little pieces of poop? What do we do with, you know, all the stuff that we collect over time? Uh, and so I, that that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, Pet G and ASA is fully recycled. So Pet G okay. and ASA are very easy to recycle, and we only sell recycled both of those of Pet G and ASA. So that is cool. There you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Poly smooth. Do you have any filaments that work with poly smooth or have you thought about moving that direction with any? Uh, someone's going to have to correct me if I'm wrong. I think poly smooth is the PLA that you can acetone smooth. Is that right? Yeah. Or like yes. vapor smooth, yes. I should say. Um, I haven't smooth, done anything with that. I haven't done any real research into it. Um, my first thing that I would probably do is like uh, um, basically send it out to a lab and uh, have it kind of like reverse engineered to figure out what's actually smoothing it. Like, I mean, it could be something as simple as mixing it with another plastic. Um, it's just it's something that I haven't looked into. Um, I don't know how popular that is. Um, it's something I would consider to be more of like a novelty type filament, um, something that is like really, really cool to see um, and just not something that everyone has like a few people will get one roll use it a little bit and then maybe not touch it as much um so if it does start growing in popularity or if i see a bunch of people that go into our discord and say hey i want poly smooth type stuff like uh basically vapor smooth pla um then i would probably be able to go to the rest of my team and say hey look how popular this is i should be researching this instead so that's kind of what i do for that we're starting to see a lot more machines kind of crop up with people wanting to do it that but that's that's an interesting and then someone was asking the difference between uh let's see what's the difference in the pla they use versus corn-based pla so what corn-based pla your your pla is there a difference is it the same what yeah so to my knowledge oh i got serious talking about corn-based pla versus uh bio-based pla there we go i don't know why siri went off um uh, to, the, all of the PLA that I've ever used has all been corn-based. Um, PLA, I'm speaking kind of out of my area of expertise here, but um, from what I've seen, like pretty much everything is made from corn. It's a bioplastic. Um, the big three companies in the world that make it are NatureWorks, uh, Total Corbion, and then um, a company called, oh, I always mess it up. It has Sun in the name. It's not eSun. It's not FL Sun. It's... I don't know, it has Sun in the name, but they're a, a Chinese company that makes the, the third one. And all three of those I know are all corn-based. Um, I think that's just where the plastic itself came from. Um, got really popular with like takeout containers and stuff. So pretty much any time that you see a wrist, like a little leaf logo on your, uh, it's not Sun Lu either. Um, I saw that in the comments. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a brand of filament. They don't make filament. Um, they just make the actual pellets themselves. Um, oh, High Sun, I think. H-I-S-U. Um, but, uh, anytime that you see like a leaf little logo on a takeout container, it's usually made from PLA. Uh, you'll usually see something that says like NGO or NW on it for nature works. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's really where PLA got popular was just because it was made from corn. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, the name polar filaments, where'd that come from? Uh, so the background for that is our logo came first. 
Um, the backstory for our little logo is a, it's, it's different now. We changed it because it was confusing. Um, but it used to be this really weird looking polar bear. Um, it just kind of looked like a, a blob kind of. Um, but that was from a, a sculpture that um, myself and then the two other founders of uh, the company, uh, we, it, was, it was a family heirloom of one of their, uh, their families. Uh, it was a ceramic sculpture about like this big. And we used to play around with it. We'd like throw it back and forth. We'd like tuck it under our shirts and run around with it. And we didn't know what it was. And then uh, one day we, we all went off to college and then his uh, parents had some friends over and they just saw it sitting over on the, on the like hearth or something. And they're like, oh, we see that you have a, a Gordon Newell piece there. And they're like, a what? And they're like, you know, the, the sculptor Gordon Newell. And they're like, what? And then they had it like valued and it turns out it's a, it's a valuable sculpture. And then the next time we came back, we weren't allowed to touch it ever again. So uh, we, we, had, we had named it, we called it Duncan. Um, we had played around with it and stuff like that. So that, that little weird shaped polar bear had like a big meaning for all of us. So we made that like our company logo. We like the polar bear type thing. So when we were coming up with polar filament, we're like, all right, we want to stick with something that would make sense if we had a polar bear as the logo. So we were trying to come up with names for that. So polar filament is where that came from. And then just recently, I think like uh, like a month or two ago, uh, we just updated our logo to actually look like a real polar bear. So that way I don't have to tell that story every time somebody says, what's that blob of a logo that you have? Um, so now it's a little bit more self-explanatory, hopefully. I like the new logo, but I do miss the old logo. It was just had a lot of character to it. It was kind of cool. You could tell there had to be something behind it. But yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. Well, Mitch, let me see if I get my music. I'm at least add my music like I normally do. There we go. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for jumping into this uh, with me. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's this has been a really good one. I, th I hope it's been informative you, to you guys. Um, as y'all can see, he's he's a smart cookie, smart cookie. Um, if you ever get a chance to sit down with him, explore his process. He has an amazing process he goes through to discover those filaments and everything that he does. Any last words you have, Mitch? Uh, yes, I have a discount for everybody that jumped in. That's good for a week. If you use discount code ASYLUM, it's 10% off for a week. So thanks for joining in. That's awesome. Hey, guys. Jump on his Discord, get over there, uh, talk with them, get in that community, get in our community. Um, I do want to thank y'all for being here tonight. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for everything that y'all have done tonight. 25K likes. I, you, you know, that is amazing. That is amazing. Y'all always amaze me. And just thank y'all for helping me with the show. I really, really appreciate it. But remember what we always say, live life to the fullest grow in wisdom and in stature and share what you have learned generously and y'all have a great night guys see y'all thank you mitch see ya